And I'm sure that many of you, like me, have had thought somewhere along the line of what happens after we die. What happens after we die? If you come from a, a Christian worldview, if you come from a Christian background, you probably understand that after we die, uh, our bodies are buried in the ground, but the scriptures teach us that many other things occur, and it's not the end of life when our physical bodies die. And so we look forward to what it will be like in heaven and what that's all going to be about. Uh, but if you're like me, you've probably thought a little bit more uh, about this idea of what will a resurrected body be like? <laughs> what will I look like? Uh, what happens to my relationships when I get to heaven? What happens to, to all that we do? How, how do we live? What's that like? Are, are we going to eat? Are we going to sleep? Are we going to work? Are we gonna, uh, what's that all going to be about? And how am I going to look? Uh, we know some answers to some of those questions, and there's other answers that we're not sure. Um, but everything that I read and everything that I see excites me about it. Uh, I am not one of those people that get excited about the idea that I'm going to float around in some kind of uh, altered state in heaven, worshiping God in this holy, never-ending praise and worship service. I mean, I'm looking forward to worship up there because it's going to be really awesome. But if you get into this thing like, you know, a million years are going to go by and we're all going to be in the same state, you kind of go, well, do I really want... You know, I mean, might be better than hell, but uh, is it really good? Um, I don't believe that that's what's going to happen when we get to heaven. Now, I'm not going to preach on what it's going to be like in heaven today, now that I've said all those things. Uh, I say all that to pique your interest and hope that you'll begin to look a little bit more deeply into the scriptures. Uh, but I do want to share with us this morning some, some things that I think are pretty awesome about what the resurrected body is going to be like, what it's going to be all about. And so if you've wondered with me, let's take a little brief look at 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 35. We find that the first place that we can look to get an understanding of what our resurrected bodies will be like is to look at the first resurrected body, that of Jesus Christ. And there are some things that we can learn from that. Uh, we know that um, uh, what Jesus was like in some ways after his resurrection. Uh, he walked on the earth for 40 days, and so people got to see him and record some of those interactions. We know that Jesus walked. We know that he ate food. So we're off to a really good start. Uh, we know that he was not immediately recognized when he was seen by people who knew him. Uh, we see a, a number of uh, occasions where he came upon somebody after he was resurrected and they started interacting with him not knowing who he was. But then somewhere along the line he would say something or he would do something and they would go, oh, now I know who you are. So we might not be physically recognizable. For some of us, that might be a good thing. Um, I won't look like this in heaven, praise the Lord. Uh, we do know that there were some physical attributes that he carried with him, though, because when he stood before the apostles in the upper room, uh, and, and Timothy was there and said, I won't believe unless I can see the nail scars, that's what he did. He said, here I am, Timothy, touch the nail scars. Touch where I was pierced in my side that you may believe. So we know that those things were still present. So there were signs of his life here on earth, physically, and yet he wasn't by nature recognizable. We also know that he was not limited by time and space. He was able to appear and disappear seemingly at will. He appeared in the upper room where the doors were locked. He just was there. And then he was gone. 
He didn't come in through the locked door, and he didn't go out through the locked door. I don't think he climbed in and out of the windows. He just appeared and then was gone, and he did on more than one occasion. Now, I, I, any science fiction buffs, you're probably thinking about that, uh, you know, teleportation and some of that other stuff, you know. I mean, it's like right out of Star Trek, isn't it? But I, I think there's going to be a sense where our physical bodies have so changed and altered that we're no longer limited by time and space. That's why a, a thousand years doesn't seem like a really long time in heaven. Right? Isn't that what God said? A day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. It's amazing when he said those words, by the way, he wasn't talking about creation. When those words are printed, that's not about creation. That's about eternity. And that's about God's sense of time. Now, what did Jesus look like? What will we look like? Will we be like Jesus? Will we have the same kinds of power and ability as Jesus? Do we even want to be resurrected? What does Paul say? The Corinthians had some of the same questions. And, and how are the dead raised? And what kind of body do we have? And, and that's, that's the question that's going on in, in the Corinthians' mind. And, and Paul writes this. Now remember that the Corinthian church were by and large academics. They were people who felt like their, their, um, their personhood, uh, their significance was measured by who was the smartest and who was the greatest and who was the more powerful. And so they sought after knowledge and understanding. They wanted to be the smartest person because society said that if you're smarter than everyone else, you're better than everyone else. And so they were striving towards that. This whole book of 1 Corinthians, he keeps going back to that. You're doing all these things to try and gain a place in society. And you got it all messed up. And so they were academics. And, and, and they wanted all this knowledge and they wanted all this understanding. And Paul was just, uh, has just explained the truth of the resurrection in the earlier parts of this chapter. And he's shown them why the resurrection is true. And he's proven the resurrection of Christ. And then he's connected the resurrection of Christ with the resurrection of people. If you're not raised, then Christ wasn't raised. And if Christ wasn't raised, then you're not raised. Remember, that's what we talked about. He's connected humans with this whole concept to prove that we too will be resurrected. Not just Christians, but all humans will be resurrected. Believers will be resurrected unto life in Christ, and unbelievers unto punishment and eternal separation from God. We shall all be raised. And the Corinthians, uh, like the logical minds of today, they can't understand how a decaying body can be brought back to life. How can we take a, a body that's been placed in a tomb and has deteriorated to nothing? Or, or even more so, there's a lot of Christians who. that you can't, um, you can't cremate a body, you know, and, and physically destroy that. Because uh, they, they think in their minds about, well, how could you take a, a body that's been cremated and then the ashes have been taken and they've been spread all over kingdom come or poured in the ocean or, you know, poured in a stream that runs for, you know, how can that all be put back together? How do you put it all back together? Now, those of us who are really religious and spiritual, we go, well, God's got all power. He took dust and he made Adam, so he can take dust and, and make us again. <coughs> but is that really what happens? Is that really what it's all about? The Corinthians say, so how are we raised? How can this possibly happen? How can this destroyed physical thing be somehow put back together? And Paul says, um... His words, not mine. You're foolish. Isn't that what he said? In essence, he says, your very question is foolish. 
It's not even the right question to ask, and it's founded on information that's incorrect. You're fools. You're asking the wrong questions. And your question displays your lack of understanding. You think that God is going to refurbish your body. Isn't that the impression we have? That God's going to somehow refurbish my body and make it better. That's the image that is in most of our minds when we think about the resurrection. And Paul says, wrong, wrong. That's not how it works. Some of you are looking at me going, of course that's how it works, Pastor. That's what we've been taught our whole lives. Of course that's how it works. Now, what I found for myself is that I really hadn't ever been taught this. I I started to think back about all the messages that I've ever heard preached about the resurrected body. And I can't think of a single one that taught me that. Frankly, I can't think of very many that have taught me anything about the resurrected body except for the fact that there will be one. And we all know that there's going to be a great feast in heaven, so we'll be able to eat, and therefore we won't get fat, and we won't have cholesterol problems in our... Right? Isn't that what we've been taught? That's the reality. That's, That's what we've been taught. Can you imagine, Paul, he's sitting there going... What's wrong with you? Well, let's look at what Paul taught. Because, you know, this isn't some foreign thing. Now, he doesn't give us a lot of details about what we're going to look like in in some of those things. But he really gives us some images that help us understand the significance of what's going on. And so he starts in verse 36 with this illustration of the seed. He says, when you plant a seed, it dies in the ground. Right? Right? You take a little bitty seed, sometimes it's a bulb or something that's a little bigger. I I like the idea of a tulip. I read about the tulip, right? I mean, how many of you have seen a tulip bulb, right? Pretty ugly, right? I mean, it looks like a miniature potato with things coming out of it, and it's dirty, and it's pretty ugly. It doesn't have any real good shape, right? And you take this thing, and you plant it in the ground, and it dies, or so we believe. Right? But what comes from it? Does God somehow take that particular tulip bulb and create a better, prettier, slightly better tulip bulb? No, he creates a flower. And that, that ugly little brown thing comes out of the ground with, with green shoots and beautiful flowers. It doesn't look at all like the bulb, does it? You remember the first time you dug up a bulb and you went, that's really how, what this flower came from? We take a, a little kernel of corn. It tastes good when it's cooked right. We take it, we stick it in the ground. It, it gets hard and it dies. Do you ever eat one that has been sitting around for a year or so? It's not very good to eat, is it? What comes up out of the ground? A kernel of corn? No, first comes a little shoot, and then the stalk, and then the ears of corn grow out of the stalk. The Bible talks about a mustard seed, and it says the the faith of a mustard seed can move the mountain. You ever wonder why he chose a mustard seed? Ladies, you know why, right? How big is a mustard seed? It's like I can't even see them, you know? There's a mustard seed in there somewhere. They're so little tiny, but how big does a mustard plant get? I mean, they'll just like take over. They're huge. The faith of a little tiny mustard seed is the kind of faith that can move a mountain. You see, what we plant in the ground and dies is not what comes forth from that. When it begins to grow, it does not grow as a seed again. It becomes a beautiful plant. It becomes far, far more than the the seed itself. Who of us would be satisfied with planting a seed in hopes of getting a seed? 
we'd give up. Why bother? Just keep the original seed. The plant is connected to the seed. It's of the same kind. Wheat doesn't bear barley. Apples, they don't bear oranges. Uh, but they're far more than what's originally planted. You see, when, when our body is planted into the ground and it dies and it begins to deteriorate, something far more, far greater, far more beautiful comes from it. It's not the seed. It's not the original body that is put back together with some improvements. God tears down the whole house and builds a new one on the original foundation. But it's a new house. It's a better house. It's a, it's a more equipped house. It's, it's got no imperfections in it. But it's not the same house. Even though it has the same foundation. God creates new from the old. He doesn't fix the old bodies. He takes the dead and He creates new. And we are the same kind, but far more. We're the same kind, but far more. Now, He illustrates this in a number of ways. He, he has created different kinds from the very beginning. He says, this shouldn't surprise you. I've created all different kinds of things. He's created all types of flesh. Verse 39, he's created human flesh and animal flesh. They're varying types. They're flesh, they have similarities, but they're different. He's created different types of birds and, and all types of fish. God says, see how, how creative I am. I, I've taken the concept of flesh and I've created it in all different ways to look all different ways. I've created different kinds of bodies. I've created heavenly bodies, and I've created earthly bodies. Heavenly and earthly. The sun, the moon, the stars. They're all different. They all interact in different ways. They all impact us differently. And yet they're all from God, all part of His creation, and they all have differing glories. We look out and we see the sun and we, we don't have any trouble understanding how much more glorifying the sun is than the moon. We know that the moon is only something that we even see because of the sun. He says, but I've created all the stars and, and now that we can look out into space and see all these things, it's like the stars that we see, those are suns. And our sun's a little bitty sun compared to all the rest of those stars. There's millions and billions of them out there. And they all have different glory. Some are bright and some are dim. We've looked out into the night sky and you see that first little star. And it has a certain glory. And then you look out later and you see the, the vastness of the millions and billions of stars. And it's a different kind of glory. God has created all things. And it's an amazing thing. He says He's created that which is perishable and that which is imperishable. He goes through this whole list, verses 32, or 42, 43, 44. Sown, things that are sown are perishable, uh, but those things that are raised are imperishable. Uh, it's not like Twinkies. <laughs> Twinkies are sown of the perishable and become imperishable. Um, not quite the same. God says that I, that I have sown this seed. I have sown this from the dust and it's perishable. Your body will die. One day it will die. Ah, but I will raise it up and it will be no more from the dust. It will now be of heaven. And it will never die. You think about that. Jesus. Jesus kind of did it backwards, didn't he? Jesus started in heaven. And then he came down and took on the form of dust. And then he died. And now he's in heaven. 
the perishable body dies and a new body is created that's imperishable, that will never die. You know our original bodies were created to be imperishable? Did you know that? When Adam and Eve were created, they were created to be imperishable. They would never die. But sin and death entered the world. They chose to sin. With the first sin came the first death because God said in order to overcome sin, there must be the shedding of blood. And so he took the first animal and he sacrificed the animal and shed its blood. He said, this represents that which I'm going to do for all of eternity. There was no death before that. By the way, if you're wondering, Adam and Eve were vegetarians before that. We know that because there was no death. No animal had ever died. Then sin and death entered the world. And our bodies became perishable. He says that seed was sown in dishonor, but it will be raised in glory. That seed was sown in weakness, but it will be raised in power. That seed was sown a natural body, but it will be raised a spiritual body. Adam was a living being, but the second Adam was a life-giving spirit. What are we going to look like? What are these bodies really going to be like? I have no clue. I don't think it matters. What I know is it's an imperishable. And the Bible tells us that there'll be no more sickness and no more suffering and no more sorrow and no more pain. It won't be the physical body that it is today. What will my relationship be with my wife and my kids? We, we ask those kinds of questions, right? What's going to happen? Remember? Somebody asked Jesus that. I gave him the story. So what happens, right? Because in Jewish custom, if, if uh, your husband died, women, then what you did was you married the brother. And you married the brother, and, and they said, so what happens if I marry the brother, and then marry the brother, and then marry the brother, and then marry the brother? And Jesus is probably thinking, you're pretty unlucky. You probably should start over. <laughs> you're sure burying a lot of men. You know, I think the brothers are leaving. <laughs> but, but what did he say? He said, you're asking the wrong question. It doesn't really matter. It really doesn't matter. What will my relationship be with my wife when we get to heaven and and we have this concept that that we'll still be married in heaven? Or maybe we won't. And, And the answer is it won't matter. Because, see, the relationships that we have here on earth, they can be really good relationships and strong relationships, and that's what God wants us. But they're a representation of what the real marriage is going to be. You see, the church is the bride of Christ. Jesus is the bridegroom. And the relationships that we have with one another, they're important and they're significant. But they're here to help us understand that which is yet to come, which will be far greater. Just as the body is perishable today, but will be recreated imperishable, so is the relationship today that is perishable. And it's fragile. And it has its places. And it can be wonderful. But one day it will be replaced with that which is far better. And I have every confidence that my wife will know me in heaven and I will know her and we will love each other. We're all going to love each other. What's going to happen in heaven? What's it going to be like? I don't know. I'm going to be the most handsome man there. (laughs) She's going to be the most beautiful bride there. No question about it. 
Of course, I, I think that all the rest of you men will be the most handsome men there and all the rest of you women will be the most beautiful women there too because beauty is not a physical thing. And what's it going to be like when we all truly represent the image of Christ? We ask the wrong questions because we want the wrong things. We want to feel better about today. We want to feel better about what's to come. And so we ask questions based on our limited understanding and minds. Questions that there's no real answers towards. We invest endless amounts of hours becoming more educated so that we can answer all of those questions. And then we fight over the answers because obviously I get it better than you do or you get it better than I do. And the reality is I'm going to have, you're going to have a resurrected, glorified body that's going to be perfectly equipped and prepared to spend the rest of eternity in right relationship with the God who loves us and gave everything that we could be with him. And I think it's a body that will be able to do work and it's a body that will be able to play and it's a body that will be able to worship perfectly. Some of you who can't sing a lick, your joyful noise is going to be more joyful than ever. We're going to have resurrected bodies, glorified bodies, not so that we can walk around and go, look at me, but so that we can walk around and worship our God in ways that we can't even comprehend today. It's natural first, spiritual second, Adam from dust, Jesus from heaven, the image of Adam that we carry today, replaced with the image of Christ that will be our lot. What does it mean to have a resurrected body? What does it look like to have a resurrected body? I haven't found any great places in Scripture that describe our physical appearance. But isn't it awesome to know whatever your self-image is today, whether it's great or whether it's horrible, whatever your struggles and your pains are today, whatever you deal with today in your life, however much you struggle with, with worshiping God, however difficult it was to be here this morning, or maybe it was really good to be here this morning, whatever it is day by day, whatever we struggle with, whatever we desire, whatever we cling towards, all of those things will be buried with this flesh. Not so that God can take it and give us something that's a little better or slightly improved, but so that the seed can be buried in the ground to produce that beautiful fruit, that beautiful flower, that perfect environment that He has for all of us. I will be one day resurrected to something new, something greater, something more amazing than we can even imagine. That's the resurrected body. What is your hope? What is your desire? What is it that you, you want or need? We have this great hope in the resurrection. And it's true and it's real 
And trust me, it's far more than any of us can ever imagine. Will you live your life based on that? Can you live your life based on that which is still to come? It should change the way we think today. It should change the way we live today because frankly most of us spend much of our lives today trying to figure out how to not be what we are. We try to figure out how to be the best that we can be at what we are but not be what we are anymore. Because we know that there's something greater. We're we're striving to become something better, to be something greater. We've been taught our whole lives to not be satisfied with where we are. We could be in a great place, but we're not satisfied. There's got to be something better. There's got to be something less imperfect that we can strive towards. And and we've been taught that our whole lives, and we have this desire, this need to, to constantly be getting better. And then eventually we get to a place where we realize there is no getting better. And we begin to prepare ourselves for the fact that we're one day going to be buried in the ground. And there is no better to seek after. And if you take it that way, if you think about it that way, if you allow that concept to creep into your mind, and most of us do inadvertently, we miss the most important part. There is something better. And even as we become senior in age, and I've reflected a little bit on that this week, as some of you may know, I am officially over the hill. I've determined I'm on the downward slope now. Uh, I'm not saying I'm close to the end. I'm just on the downward slope because, you know, eventually you just do the math and you go, okay, you know, there's got to be a middle point somewhere. And unless I live to be over 100, I've crossed the middle point, okay? But the reality is, I don't don't have to be down, and I don't have to be discouraged, and I don't have to be upset. And yeah, it's, it's harder and harder for my physical body to do that which it should. And I have to to fight with it and struggle day by day. And there's all the other pains and struggles and issues that come along with that. And my body is not going to get better. I can do some things to help improve it a little bit, but ultimately it is not going to get better. It is going to progress unto death unless the Lord returns before I receive that day. But that day marks the beginning of a new creation. Now for some, that day will mark the end of the best that you'll ever receive. You see, there is a resurrection both unto life and unto death for those who know Christ, a new glorified body for all of eternity, worshiping God in heaven. But for those who have rejected his offer of salvation, It's a resurrection to a body that will be eternally damned to hell and separation from God. Do we want the heaven or the hell? Which do we want? Which do we strive after? For most of us in this room, we've already made that choice. We've already chose Jesus as our Savior. We've already chose the heavenly body. We've already picked that, and we can live in that. But can we live in a place that we're surrounded by people who have chosen opposite us and not do something? Can we live there? And not do something. My hope is in glory. My hope is in heaven. My hope is in a new created being that's going to be better equipped, more.
equipped, more effective and efficient in worshiping God for all of eternity and serving Him and doing all those things that I wish I did better today. That's all going to be there. But what about the people around me who don't even know, who have never even heard? I mentioned it a couple times in the past few weeks. We've been deceived. We've been deceived in our world into believing that, that our, our spiritual life, our, our Christianity is a personal thing. It's not. It's not. It's a personal decision, but it's not a personal thing. Jesus said, if you deny me before man, I will deny you before my Father. That doesn't sound personal to me. That sounds like something we're supposed to be saying and talking about and doing every single day. And my hope is not in what I get for that. My hope is in the glory of what I'm going to have one day. But we're supposed to live eternal life when we receive it. And we receive eternal life when we receive Jesus, not when we die. I am not going to die. My spirit, if it were to leave today, would be with Jesus in glory. Amen. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My eternal life already began. My spirit's already there. I'm already growing and becoming more and more of what I'm going to eventually become. That is not personal. That is not private. That is so much more. And it's the hope of the resurrection that gives us the strength and the power when we don't feel like it to get up and do it. It's, it's the hope of the resurrection that says, they may persecute me, but, but what's the downside? You, you can take my physical body, you can martyr me, what's the downside? Because when you take this body, as impure as it is and imperfect as it is, I'm going to be with Jesus. What's the downside? Paul said it well, didn't he? (laughs) Didn't Paul say, oh, I just want to be done. I want to go to heaven. I want to be with God. But you've told me I need to stay, so I'm going to stay and I'm going to work until you take me home. Every one of you, God has something specifically planned for you to do. Did you know that? There is a purpose and plan in your life. And some of you are going, I'm so old, I've already done that. No, you haven't. There's still something coming. Because if there wasn't, then God would just say, you're done, come home. But you're still here. You still have a place. You still have a task. You still have something that God wants you to do for His glory to build His kingdom. And sometimes that's really hard. Sometimes that's really hard. I I remember meeting with a lady. She was in her late 80s and she had been bedridden for about 15 years. She's a good Christian lady, and she just loved it if you just come and read the Bible to her. But she would lay in that bed and go, I don't know why God keeps me here. I wish he would just take me. I wish he would just take me. I wish he would just take me on and on. I wish he would just take me. And I kept trying to say, you don't understand. There's still a purpose. There's still something. And when we get to that place where we stop worrying about, I wish he would just take me. I wish he would deliver me from this pain. I wish he would deliver me from this stuff and resurrect my body now because I want the good and I'm not. If we get past that and we get to a place in our lives that we go, what is it that you have for me today? Why am I here? What is it that you need? What is this pain going to be used for? How is it going to be used to glorify you? What is this difficulty going to do in the lives of other people? How is this going to help me build your kingdom? How am I going to bring you glory? We've been around those people, haven't we? Haven't you been to the hospital to see that person who knows that their cancer is going to eat them alive? that are in pain, and you walk into the room, and, and, and you're down, and you're going, well, how am I going to say to this person? And they begin to pick you up because they understand. We know those people. We've seen those people. But every one of us are those people. Every one of us, when we understand the resurrected body, when we understand the work that God has called us to, every one of us are those people. 
Our pain and our struggles, they're not there because God hates us and he's trying to punish us. They're there because God has something special to do in our lives and he's going to use that for his glory. And when we can latch on to that and hold on to that and realize I one day will be resurrected. I one day will have all of this gone because I'll be with my Savior and I'll have the new body and I'll have the glorified body and I might even be able to just transport myself from wherever I want to go to wherever. You know, you want to go to Hawaii? Okay, just, you know, go hang out for a while. That's coming. But there's a reason. There's a purpose for why why we are now, where we are now. And we can complain about life and we can complain about all the stuff or we can latch on to God. And we can spend every day saying, what is it today? Use me today. Somebody needs something that I have. Whether it's an understanding of your pain, an encouraging word, Just being able to look at you and go, how do you survive? What do you mean? (laughs) This this old crusty shell, (laughs) it's temporary. It's just going to fall away and it's going to be gone. It's going to be replaced. It's a seed that's going to be planted in the ground and it's going to die. But from it, it's going to come an amazing and beautiful thing that God has created. Can you live there? Can you live there? It's easy to say when we're doing well. It's a lot more difficult when things are tough. But greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. You see, that doesn't come because we will ourselves. That comes because the Holy Spirit lives within us. You see, it starts natural, but it becomes spiritual. It starts human. It becomes something far more. It starts perishable. It becomes imperishable. I'm going to be resurrected one day. Look forward to it. But I don't need to be the natural person any longer. I want to live the spiritual life today. What will you do? What choices will you make? Father, thank you for your word and and for what you do for us. You you are such an amazing God. And when we think about all of this, it's almost mind-boggling to to get beyond ourselves and to get beyond the, the day and to get beyond the stuff and the pain and the struggles and get to that next place. But Father, you are so amazing and you are holy. And you want us to pour ourselves out in worship to you. And that's, that's coming to church on Sunday morning and singing and reading your word. But it's, it's so much more than that. It's living every day in the power of the resurrection. It's living every day with an understanding of the Holy Spirit living within us. It's living every day with the eyes of Jesus Christ that says, I love that person. Every single one that I see. I'm willing to give myself for them even if they reject me. That is the life that you've called us to. Lord, help us to live the resurrected life today. Because, Lord, there are those around us who will be resurrected one day. And if we're not doing that which you've called us to, they will not be all that you desire them to be. Lead us, Lord, in how we live, that you will be glorified, not only here on earth, but for all eternity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.